All right. Good morning, good afternoon, my gremlins, or good night, wherever you're, whenever you are watching this. So what I'm going to do uh, is I'm going to break up these videos. Uh, you're going to find them throughout the PowerPoint. I'm going to go through a couple of slides each video, and uh, this way you can take your time, pause, take notes, um, just listen, uh, whatever you need to do, print out the notes, anything you got to do in order to um, retain the information we're going to talk about. So let's go through um, and let's start with um, the first slide I need to get to right here. So we last left off talking the most about um, JFK. We are now going to close the chapter, to close the book, if you will, on JFK. Say goodbye. Um, JFK, as we know, gets assassinated by Lee Harvey Oswald in uh, November 1963. So that means, according to the Constitution, we have his vice president pop up. Okay, He is Lyndon Johnson, Lyndon Baines Johnson. He is going to be the, um, the new guy, Okay, the new president. He's a Democrat from Texas. He is a uh, big New Deal supporter. He is someone who... Um, uh, was a former teacher. He also uh, was a beneficiary of the New Deal. He was um, uh, met with Roosevelt in Texas during the Great Depression, uh, loved the New Deal programs, was um, someone who admired uh, FDR a lot. So it's no shock that when he gets his chance to be president, he is going to model his domestic policy, his domestic plans off of uh, FDR. So Lyndon Johnson's domestic program is called the Great Society, uh, and as I've already mentioned, it's a great extension or a big extension of the New Deal. So he is going to um, put a lot of emphasis on what we call the welfare state, okay, which we have talked about before in the past. So unlike the New Deal, the Great Society is going to touch on one topic that we did not mention during the New Deal, and that's civil rights, right? Lyndon Johnson is going to be president during those two pieces of legislation we talked about last week, like the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Other areas of concern of the Great Society uh, is immigration. Uh, he is going to reverse or open up the doors, okay, for immigrants coming to the country once again. We'll see that in uh, a moment. Uh, education, former teacher, like I said. So he is going to be uh, all about funding money towards education, math and science, uh, et cetera, and libraries, reading, we'll talk about. And medical help for the elderly, okay, and that's also something we'll talk about in a moment where we see some of those things still around today. So um, part of his great society, uh, a couple things to talk about, a lot of the issues that uh, Lyndon Johnson is going to focus on is going to be um, the people living in poverty in our country during his time period. Um, and you're going to see uh, Michael Harrington, as we remember this ID term from a couple weeks ago, the other America, who sheds light on 40 million people living in poverty in America, which is interesting because we don't normally think about how Americans are impoverished. Uh, but this is brought to light, and Lyndon Johnson declares what he calls a uh, war on poverty, where he wants to spend a lot of time uh, and resources to combating poverty in America. So him and Congress, they passed the uh, Office of Economic Opportunity, where they're going to create programs like Head Start. And Head Start is a program that's still around today. This is preschool. Uh, the government is uh, supporting uh, money to go to preschools because, as we know through research, preschool is very important to um, developmental uh, abilities of children and helps them in things like literacy, IQ, etc. Job Corps, uh, vocational education, so kind of like your BOCES programs today, where if kids aren't into school and school is not their thing, maybe they should learn a trade, and that's what the Job Corps does. Uh, literacy and legal programs, where, as we said, former teacher, he's all about trying to get people to read and write, and uh, that is obviously very good for um, people to get good professions later on in life. 
We also mentioned in the last slide that immigration and uh, he is going to open up the doors through the Nationality, Edu Nationality Act of 1965, where um, he is going to reverse the quota laws in the National Origins Act of 1921 and 1924. And we see now for the first time in 40 years, people being welcomed into the country. And so this is opening the doors once again um, through legislation, which we haven't seen in a while. Okay, so Lyndon Johnson, he finishes out JFK's term, and he runs for his own term in 1964. Uh, he's now on his own ticket, right? Now he's running for himself to be president. Um, and as you can see in the top there on the map, he is overwhelmingly going to win the Electoral College to become the next president. He runs up against Barry Goldwater, as you saw in your homework, the... Um, the severity, if you will, of you know the propaganda that these guys are using in uh, in their campaigning, and you see how um, you know the the propaganda in the commercial and you know the Cold War era and all that, all those sentiments you know, going on. But ultimately, obviously, Lyndon Johnson in a landslide victory, he wins. Obviously, very excited about that in the bottom right there with his dog, and. We know Lyndon Johnson is a Democrat, and he's going to be very liberal. Um, now, we usually associate liberals as being Democrats, and liberals usually are associated with expanding government, uh, whereas conservatives, they're the opposite. Okay, Conservatives are usually Republicans, and they usually support small government and less government intervention, right? Conservatives, we've talked about, you know, the 1920s presidents, your laissez-faire presidents, your Gilded Age presidents who were very, um, you know, laissez-faire, if you will, whereas guys like uh, Lyndon Johnson and FDR or Teddy Roosevelt, they're very liberal and getting involved in people's lives, uh, the economy, business, etc. Um, but beware, the conservatives are going to go back to the drawing board here after losing to Lyndon Johnson, and they'll come back in four years with a better platform and a better idea of how to defeat those liberals, those Democrats. Next. We have some of the New Deal, or sorry, Great Society programs um, that were uh, aforementioned before. So one of the things we said that Lena Johnson is going to focus in on is elderly medical care. And uh, he helps create something called Medicare. And Medicare is still around today, so you might have heard of it. Medicare is health care for the elderly and uh, just the way to remember it is you know we care for our elderly and so we have medicare you know because obviously at 65 years old you know you're probably retired uh, you're probably collecting that social security by now so you don't have a job but you know how are you going to pay all those bills for you know those uh, those medical bills that are you know stacking up and so the government says don't worry about it you're old you don't probably have a job so we'll pay for it through medicare now medicaid is similar Okay, it's the government paying for your health care, but at this instance, it's paying for those who are less fortunate and don't have enough money or have a good job to pay for that. All right, so Medicaid is a little bit different. That is not for elderly. That is for those who are less fortunate. Other things that the Great Society tackles, things like food stamps, also still around today. Um, the government will help you buy uh, staple food items uh, to get by to feed your family like you know, whether it be diapers or bread, butter, milk, etc. Um, he, Lennon Johnson, approved money for the arts. Okay, so your music programs uh, are going to get a lot of funding. Art and music programs are going to get a lot of funding from Lennon Johnson, former teacher, remember. 
helping housing projects, uh, low income housing, we call it. So people that can't afford to buy that nice little white picket fence uh, house in the Levittowns in suburbia, uh, the government through the Great Society is going to fund money for more public housing to be created for people to live in. And then finally, regulation of auto industry. Uh, this is the time period, and this is just a side note, not necessarily for you to know, but um, where we put rear view mirrors and things like that on cars and seat belts, uh, to, you know, for safety reasons. Next, um, Rachel Carson. Uh, this is someone for, you know, you guys probably know who she is from other classes, whether it be bio or research or whatnot. Uh, she writes a book called The Silent Spring, where she exposes the use of pesticides and how harmful that could be for us and the environment. Uh, we're eating, you know, things and fruits and uh, produce that have these pesticides on them to prevent bugs from eating them, but yet we're ingesting them and it's probably not good for our health and the environment and it leaking into the water table, etc. And the Great Society, what it's doing here is it's expanding the welfare state. As I mentioned before, uh, the welfare state means the government is getting very involved. They're expanding the government um, and they're getting involved in things like business, economy, or people's lives, like the poor, disabled, elderly. Uh, and this is the, the safety net, right? The government's going to help you if you run into hard times. You're not just there on your own, like good old Hoover, Herbert, Herbert Hoover said, you know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, that rugged, individualized uh, idea of a conservative. However, um, a lot of people are going to say these things were too costly. Uh, we're spending a lot of money on this stuff, and it's inefficient, it's idealistic, and you're allowing people to become too independent are too deep dependent, I'm sorry, on these programs, and they're not going to want to get a job that pays more in order to get off those food stamps. Okay, so let's get to um, where most people uh, remember Lyndon Johnson for. Uh, unfortunately, his good work in the Great Society is not always remembered um, because most of his presidency is stained by the conflict in Vietnam. So Vietnam is a really complicated story. It's not something that um, I can effectively sum up in 20 minutes. I'm going to do my best. But I will say, if you're interested in more information about this, you're always welcome to, answer, to ask me questions via email or um, if you get a chance in college to take an elective, uh, to take a Vietnam era class because it's, uh, it's an insane time period in U.S. history and there's so much to learn and so many different nuances that occur during this era. So let's, let's start uh, with the story here about Vietnam, and it starts at the end of World War II. And the beginning of the story is going to sound really familiar, so beware. So the end of World War II, um, the Japanese, right, their empire in the World War II era uh, extended into places like Korea and China. It also extended into places like Vietnam, which was called South Indochina. South meaning under, or uh, Indo meaning under, okay, China, because Vietnam is exactly that. It's underneath China. So World War II is over, the Japanese leave, they're kicked out, and France assumes the imperial power position of being in control of Vietnam. And the French didn't really have a lot of money or resources or time to deal with uh, the issues in Vietnam because it's really an issue of a civil war. What's the issue? The issue is there's a lot of communists within Vietnam. Okay, so that's, uh, that's interesting. And the Allies decide that the solution should be to divide the country in half, send the communists to the north, and the nationalists, or those that believe in democracy, go to the south. So that should sound really familiar to a story we talk about with Korea, right? The country is split in half, and the communists to the north, and the nationalists go to the south. So the French no longer can be in control, be in charge here of Vietnam. And so they say, hey, listen, who wants to take over for us? And the United States raises their hands and they say, we got you. Okay, we'll take over. 
So the French are out, the Americans are in, and they're overseeing this little conflict here in Vietnam. During the Eisenhower years, he sends some quote-unquote uh, military advisors, it's basically just troops. Um, nothing major happens. In JFK years, um, same thing. He only puts in some more military advisors, but nothing major happens until he gets the Lyndon Johnson administration where we have a turning point in the Vietnam conflict where things intensify. So that brings us to 1964, the Gulf of Tonkin incident. So what happens here is, again, this is a little story within the story of Vietnam. Uh, Lyndon Johnson gets a call one night from a battleship who is chilling out in the waters of what we call the Gulf of Tonkin. And this is the body of water right outside Vietnam. And our battleship, they believe they got shot at. So they tell Lyndon Johnson this, and he is in a rage. He's a Texas dude. He's a Southerner. He is outraged. He goes to Congress. He tells them about this, and Congress is also enraged. And they issue what we're going to call a blank check. Now, no, they don't give him a check as you know, as far as like a check for money. Um, this is a metaphor for saying, you know, what would you do if someone gave you a blank check? Well you'd probably write in your own amount because you can take advantage of how much money you can get, right? So what Congress just has done is they said, listen, Lyndon Johnson, um, because of this incident in Vietnam, because of the Gulf of Tonkin, we're going to give you unlimited power with Vietnam. Do what you got to do to end the conflict um, and good luck. And now this was a big mistake because what they've just done is they never declared war, but they gave the power to the president to essentially resolve this conflict in Vietnam. That's going to be a no-no. Anyways, the sad thing is that the story I told you about the battleship getting shot at one night was probably not the battleship getting shot at. There was no evidence that it actually happened. What actually did happen was that there was a thunderstorm and that they thought they were getting shot at, but they saw lightning and they mistook it for being shot at and thunder, obviously, the loud booms. Awesome. And for four years after the Gulf of Tonkin, uh, Johnson is sending more and more troops and we're bombing the hell out of them. And Johnson's going on TV and the general in charge, Westmoreland, he's telling people that the war in Vietnam is going well. It's going to end soon. It, it, you know, we got it under control. But then something happens in 1968 that basically shows us the government was lying to us. And it was called the Tet Offensive. This is the Vietnamese New Year. And what happens is in January, um, the uh, North Vietnamese, okay, simultaneously attack us at all of our bases in South Vietnam. Wait, this is supposed to be our stronghold, right? South Vietnam is supposed to be where we're safe. But the North Vietnamese snuck up on us and surprise attacked us at all of our bases in South Vietnam. So then people start raising the question, well, how is it the government was telling us for the last four years that we were okay and that uh, the war was going to be over soon? You're going to see a lot of anti-war opposition rise out of this conflict of the Tet Offensive. So you start to see the relationship between Americans and the government start to deteriorate here because of the Tet Offensive.